focus here on the story of Nathaniel Bacon in our second uh, lecture on chapter 2. Because I think the story of Bacon is very instructive not only to the colonial period, but also to the revolutionary period that's going to happen 100 years later. From 1642 to 1677, the governor of Virginia was a man named William Berkeley, and he completely dominated uh, Virginia. Um, by 1644, Virginia had pacified the Native Americans in the western part. That's the part away from the coast, right? And they had established a boundary. They had established a line and told the Native Americans, you can stay on that side and, and the English colonists will be on this side. And this leads to a period of rapid growth in Virginia. Between 1640 and 1660, the population of Virginia goes from 8,000 to 40,000. Virginia is finding a lot of success. Berkeley will at once team up with the large landowners to try to prevent other new large landowners from gaining power. And at the same time, he'll start having secret deals to trade furs and other goods with the Native Americans in the West. Uh, now, this is a little shady because these two groups are pretty strongly opposed. And the, and, and the, the backwoods planters, the people in the West who tend to be poor, smaller landowners, freed indentured servants for the most part, hate the Native Americans and see them as their, their great enemies. So if they had any idea that Berkeley had, was doing business with them, they would be angry. But they don't yet. And into this environment, in uh, the 1670s, comes a man named Nathaniel Bacon. Now, Nathaniel Bacon is what we call a second son. He was actually further down the line than just second. But the term second son means this. Back at the time when, if you were to die, if you were a man and you died, your property would go to your oldest son. It would not be divided. It would just go to the oldest son. All your other children might inherit some money, but they would not inherit any land, so they wouldn't inherit any real source of wealth for the long haul. And so second sons had to find some other, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and so on, sons had to find some other way to support themselves and, and make their money in the world. Nathaniel Bacon had grown up in England and was constantly getting in trouble, constantly causing problems, a number of failed businesses, and run-ins with the law and fights and all this sort of stuff. And so eventually his family encourages him to move to Virginia and find his fortune there. When he gets to Virginia, all the land by the coast is taken, so he has to move to the western part, to the interior, and set up a plantation there. He asked to join the council, and as a high-ranking noble son, uh, as son of a nobleman, he kind of has the right to join the council in a way. That's kind of an expectation. But Berkeley is uninterested in letting new uh, landowners into the circle of power, tells him no. Bacon then uh, comes to find out that Berkeley is trading fur with the Native Americans, and he goes to Berkeley and says, I know what you're doing. You need to give me some of the money you're making, or I'm going to tell everybody. And Berkeley uh, refuses. Bacon then asks if he can expand his plantation beyond the line that has been set up, separating the Native Americans and the uh, uh, the settlers, and Ber the governor Berkeley again says no. Bacon getting ang uh, is getting increasingly angry. And in 1675, when a war breaks out between the settlers and the Native Americans, the settlers, of course, are trying to expand west into Native American land. Berkeley refuses to send the militia to help and says the settlers started the war, they should deal with it. The settlers organize themselves into a militia, and Bacon becomes their leader, their general. After they pacify the Native Americans, Bacon decides to take this army that has been organized to fight the Native Americans and attack Jamestown and try to seize control from Berkeley. He does this, and the settlers and Bacon, take, uh, the poor settlers, I should say, the freed indentureds and the, the small farmers, take Jamestown. Um, uh, Berkeley pardons Bacon and promises Bacon that he'll allow him into the circle of power and allow him to start making money off his crooked businesses and stuff. But as soon as Berkeley goes back to his plantation, Berkeley reneges and orders Bacon arrested. So Bacon reorganizes his militia, goes back to Jamestown. Berkeley runs away. They burn Jamestown to the ground. And Nathaniel Bacon declares that Virginia is no longer an English colony, that it is now its own independent state with, Berkeley, with Bacon as the leader. Excuse me. He negotiates a peace treaty. Uh, um, no, scratch that. Never mind. But then something unfortunate happens from the point of view of, of Bacon anyway. He gets dysentery and dies. That's literally where you get diarrhea until you dehydrate and die. Berkeley returns, seizes control of the colony, returns it to royal control, negotiates a peace treaty with the Native Americans, and for the most part, things go back to the way they were. 
Now, this is the American Revolution 100 years too early. This is, these issues are very, very similar. The colonists are going to want to go west. Um, the colonists are going to reject royal control. Uh, up and coming colonists are going to be refused admission into the circle of power, which is what's going to happen with George Washington. And they are going to organize and fight against royal authority. This is exactly 100 years before the revolution begins, 1675, 1676. Um, and it is almost the exact same storyline. Except in this one, the leader, Nathaniel Bacon, dies suddenly. If he hadn't, maybe we have independence 100 years earlier. That's one of the reasons I find it so interesting. It also reveals the tensions in this society, the whites versus the Native Americans, uh, the free wealthy landowner versus the indentured servants and the freed indentured servants, the what they call tidewater aristocracy, those are the wealthy landowners along the coast, versus the backcountry farmer, those are the poor landowners in the interior. This east versus west split is far more important than any north-south dynamic that we're going to see uh, much later. But the most important impact of, Nathan, of Bacon's Rebellion, and if you get asked about this on the AP test, this is almost certainly what they're asking about, is this. The indentured servant system, where you brought a white guy over, he worked for you for a period of years, and then he was freed. Uh, the, the, the aristocracy is going to blame Bacon's Rebellion on that system. They're going to say this, this large population of landless, free, indentured servants is unstable and can't be trusted. And therefore, we need a new system of labor. Now, I mentioned sla the slaves first arrive in Virginia in 1619, but they will not become a major presence in, in, in America until after Bacon's Rebellion, when wealthy landowners say, we don't want the indentured servant system anymore because once they get freed, they become a problem. We need servants that will never be free. They're going to turn to slavery at this point. And Bacon's Rebellion marks the turn away from white indentured servitude towards African-American slave labor as a labor force. And that's ultimately probably its most important impact. Anyway, next time we'll talk about uh, the pilgrims. All right, until then.